I hope you were able to do something for God last week. I hope you were able to step out and bless somebody in a way, stretch a little bit, and, and be a blessing. We were reading last week about Jesus, how he took the seven loaves and he fed 4,000 people, at least 4,000 people. And uh, now we're going to be picking up in chapter 8, and we're going to be picking up from verse 22. Father, I pray, God, that you bless this word, Lord, that it would speak to our hearts, that everyone listening, Lord, would receive something from it, that it would feed us, Lord, and nourish us, nourish our hearts, our souls, and our minds, God. I pray that this word would help us to draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So verse 22 of Mark chapter 8. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and they besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands upon him and asked if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. And after he put his hands upon his eyes, he made him look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his own house saying, Neither go into the town nor tell it to anyone in the town. So we'll stop there for a minute. So this man, this blind man, the first thing that Jesus did with him was he took him out of the town. And I don't want to miss that because there's times where God takes us out of everything we're familiar with in order to give us what he has for us. And uh, there's lots of examples for that in the Bible. You have Israel, you know, got taken out of Egypt to receive what God had for them on Mount Sinai. And Jesus, when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he was taken out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, but then to be ministered to by angels. All the disciples were called away from their previous lifestyles. You know, they were fishermen and tax collectors, and they were, they were taken away from what they've known to follow God. Um, in my own life, that's what happened with me. Uh, I was, I'm born and raised in New York. My family's in New York, but I was not in New York when I, when I gave my life to God. I was actually in Maine. So God took me away from everything I had known to give me what he had for me. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that, because sometimes the things that we know that we're familiar with um, um, can be something that we would lean on or turn to uh, when things get tough. But if, if we get taken away from what's familiar, God is able to give us something new. And, and, uh, and that's a good thing that we need. So if you see your life changing and you see uh, certain things being taken away from you in a way that hasn't happened yet, that might be an indication that God is working in your life and he's, he's removing things from you that you might feel are important, but God knows it's better that they get taken away so that he can give you something even better. Um, so this blind man, one of the things that Jesus did, it says he spit and put the spit in the man's eyes. So... You know, for us, sometimes we think about these things like, you know, you know, it's kind of like ha hard to make a connection. Like, what is, why doesn't you just tell him to be healed? Why spit in his eyes? That's, that's weird. But if you read the scriptures and you, and you, and you can really appreciate what God, ha the way he's created everything, the spiritual world is tied together with the natural world. Um, there's so many different things. Like, there's another part where Jesus heals a man with clay. He uses clay. Um, as Christians, the Christians are commanded to, to, to baptize. You know, that's a natural thing. It's, it's a symbolic thing, but there's meaning in it. We're also commanded to take communion, which is where we, where we acknowledge that Jesus' body was broken for us and that his blood is symbolic of the wine that we, we take in and we do this in remembrance of him. This natural world, everything that we do in the world that we live in, has an effect spiritually. You know, like, this world just echoes, echoes what's going to be for eternity. So everything we do and say matters. Everything that, that every choice we make, it has an impact. And, and if you have certain things or habits in your life that you might be telling yourself, oh, this isn't a big deal, it really doesn't matter towards my relationship with God, you're deceiving yourself because everything you do matters. Because God, He looks at your heart. He looks, he looks deep within you to see uh, what, what you're really all about. There's no, nothing hidden from God. And if you have a love or a passion or uh, an indulgence in a way that's not honoring God, then God can't really operate in your life the way that He wants to. So everything that you do and say matters. Everything that we do in this life does matter. They're, the spiritual world and the natural world are connected. And we might not really realize the full 
uh, parameters and, and every area that the connection is and how it all impacts, we don't need to understand that. But we need to know that what we do in this natural world does affect the spiritual world. Um, so, so Jesus took this man out where I, he, he healed his eyes. Um, he's seen clearly. And then he tells the man, and he says, he sent them away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell it to anyone in the town. And why would Jesus tell this man not to tell it to anybody? He just did a miracle. Why wouldn't Jesus want the miracle to be publicized? Um, one of the things that I think could be a reason is because maybe Jesus just wanted the focus to be on the gospel, on his words. Um, you know, if, if, if everybody's always talking about miracles, then they might be missing what, what, what the substance of why the miracles are happening. The message that Jesus is bringing, the message of repentance, the, rem the message of God's love, the message of God's heart for mankind. So that might be one of the reasons why Jesus told the man not to say anything. Um, there could be others. Maybe you could think of some, and if you, if you can, let me know. You know, maybe send me a message or something and say, hey, maybe it was this, because I'm interested to hear what you think. So verse 27, And Jesus went out and said to his disciples, Go into the town of Caesarea and Philippi, Oh, I'm sorry, Jesus went with his disciples into the, uh, into the town of Caesarea and Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, uh, but some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom ye say that I am? And Peter answered and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no one, no man about him. So Peter had the revelation, and in Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says that that actually came from God. Nobody showed you that, Peter, but it actually was revealed by God. And a really important thing there in verse 29 that we really need to get out of that is that revelation for who Jesus Christ is and who God is and the big scheme of everything comes from being alone and spending time with God. The disciples spent time with Jesus, and if you want to know why you're here and what you know who Jesus is, and understand the 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 full magnitude and the great glory and the awesome power um, of God, you need to spend time with God. You need to spend time in prayer. Now, I need this in my own life, and I struggle with these things in my own life, making time to pray, making time to read. And I was actually just talking to my wife about that earlier today, about how I haven't really made the time that I need to make. To, to develop my relationship with God and that my reading has been suffering and all kinds of things. And I could share that with you because I'm being honest with you. But I know that in order for me to stay on track and to be full of God's Spirit, I have to make alone time with God. And that's the same thing that you need to do. So Peter did have that alone time with, with, with God and God revealed to him that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the one to come. He's the one that is going to deliver all the people. And He is our deliverance, Lord. Praise God. So it says, And He charged them that they should tell no man of Him. And that's an interesting thing, because as we've been reading in Mark, we've, we've, we've heard Jesus has told, several times Jesus has told people to not say anything about who He is. He's, he's always trying to buffer, you know, um, you know, buffer His um, fame getting out there. You know, I mean, one thing for sure is we don't, Jesus is not concerned about being famous. He knows that the gospel is going to go into all the world. He knows that God's going to accomplish his plan to save the world and bring salvation to all, all coasts. So he doesn't need to worry about that. So one thing that's very clear is that Jesus is not trying to become super famous, super fast. It's not his concern at all. There's a lot of things Jesus does with his disciples and people that are private and, it's, and are special. Now Jesus impacts the entire world. This one man who, who came into the world and he, he, he came into an insignificant place. He, uh, he, was, you know, he wasn't born to a wealthy family and he just has ch changed the entire world. This entire world has been affected by Jesus Christ. And, and yet... He was telling people not to talk about him. And, and as we read about him, he had this intimate, private time with his disciples and, and those that he loved. And I just think it's so amazing how, how just if you make time for God, 
you'll have time to do everything else that you need. I know I've said that before, but it's, it's worth saying again. You make time for God, and you'll have time to do everything that you need to accomplish. So, reading on, we'll say, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake, saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. And when he had turned about, he looked at his disciples, he, and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things of God, but the things of men. So, Jesus is, reveals to his disciples, he reveals to them what he's going to go through, that he's going to suffer, that he's going to die, and that he's going to rise again. And this is God's will for Jesus' life. He's revealing that. And at that moment, Peter, right after Peter just all of a sudden had a revelation from God about who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah, now Peter's getting rebuked by Jesus, and Jesus is telling him, get behind me, Satan. Now, is Peter literally possessed with Satan, by Satan? I don't know. All I know is that he's getting a full rebuke and being called Satan because he is telling Jesus that he should not be doing what God has sent him into the world to do. Jesus has to suffer. He had to suffer. He had to go through what he went through so that you and me can be set free. If he didn't suffer, then we wouldn't be free. So we needed Jesus to do that. And, and thank God that God sent Jesus, that his love was so great that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for us. And, and there's going to be times in your life where you think you're doing the right thing or giving somebody good advice, but it's not God's will. So you have to make sure that you're on the right end, uh, you know, at the right, you're on the right place with that. Because you don't want to be in a position where you're giving somebody counsel against what God really wants for them. So he said, Thou savorest not the things of God, but the things of men. So we're going to end there on verse 33 for this week. And um, just we're going to end on that one part where thou savorest the things of men and not of God. Because that's something that we're all guilty of. Um, you and me alike. We're guilty of caring about the things of this world and not the things of God, for making that choice. Because we always have to choose what we do in our life. We have to choose what we love and what we don't love. Um, and we have to make it our practice to care about the things of God. We have to make it our practice to sacrifice the things of this world, the pleasures that, or, or the, the things that we enjoy might have to die. They might have to be let go. We might have to move on from them. And we will have to move on from them, many of them, because they don't really add to us spiritually. We live in a place of comfort and pleasure, and that's everything that this world has to offer. But we don't need all of that. We really don't need all these pleasures. They don't really edify our souls. If you really want to be used by God, you have to be willing to die to your natural desires and your passions. Um, and that was really what Jesus was teaching. If you want God you got to give up everything else. If you give up everything else, God will take care of you. But this is, again, faith. You have to have faith in God's ability to take care of you and His love for you, that He's going to take care of you and your family. So uh, I just ask that maybe this week you think about areas in your life or things that you have in your life that you know God does not want you to have in your life that maybe it's time for you to let go of those things. Maybe it's time to say goodbye to them, uh, to remove them. And then I, I, I hope that you will be able to do that. And by next week, you would have already gotten them out of your life and be walking in a, a more full relationship with God. So, Father, I thank you for your word today. I ask God that you would bless uh, all of us, God, who uh, have just read it, Lord, together and heard it. I pray, God, that you would help us to have that full life with you, that full relationship, God. I pray that your spirit would fill our hearts, Lord, and that we would be enriched um, in the kingdom. I pray that we would store up treasure in heaven and not here on earth. And we just thank you, God, for your great word. And I pray, Lord, that you would use us as your vessels to do your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.